All right. Seems like I'm live. I'm testing out a, <clears throat> a mobile setup. If you guys are here, type one. That will help me to know if I'm being heard and heard properly. Let me see something on another device. But yeah, definitely, if you guys don't mind, man, um, let me know if you're hearing me. Let me know if there's uh, feedback or anything of that nature. We're talking about African religious survivals as factors in American slave revolts tonight. Um, I don't want to get too far ahead. It's important that I know. Let me see. Don't want to get too far ahead. Okay, it sounds like I'm it sounds like I'm good. It sounds like I sound good here with this setup. So this setup I could use when I'm mobile. So that's good to know. All right. So the show tonight, we're reading this this William C. Suttles Jr. paper. It's a pretty old paper. He was a doctoral student back in the 70s and wrote this paper. And his focus was on how African religions and the fact that uh, our ancestors in the Americas still carried on some of the African religious traditions, how that was a factor in American slave revolt. I want to thank you guys for tuning in. I also want to thank you guys for tuning in on Saturday Night Shoot the Breeze. Uh, it's always a good time when you guys do that. So, okay, now that I know that the setup is working, that the sound is fine, um, let's do a station ID, right? Let's do a station ID break, and on the other side, sorry, let's do the intro, not a station ID. Let's do the intro, and on, on the other side, we will read tonight's uh, paper. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAC Radio. Welcome to the Bitter Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people and strategies that uplift, empower and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Koku. Just want to remind you guys before we get the show rolling that this show is part of a podcast network called KWAZ Radio. The other shows on the network you are invited to tune into. This is D Webb with the Harsh Reality Podcast. Ask you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the revolutionary matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Yes, indeed. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Koku. Uh, you know, before I get into the read, let me just say this too. I'm putting this call out there again. Um, we need, you know, if, if you're going to be a, a podcast network, we need more participants. I'm just going to keep it real. And also, we need more folks supporting these shows too. I, I think a big part of the problem is we're losing folks from the network because it takes a lot to do this work. I'm not complaining about it. I'm just stating a fact. 
takes a lot to do this work. And if you can't get, uh, if you can't get financially compensated, you'd at least like to see good numbers of people when, you know, when we put up these videos, when we do these live streams. So I just want to stress that we, uh, we really need to get more people on the network. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's your cousin and them. Maybe that's your, your auntie and them. Maybe it's a group of you. And together, you guys can do a show. But we need more people doing shows, talking to talk, but also doing the work outside as well and bringing that back to the, to the family when we do these shows. So I just want to put that out there, okay? We're, we're losing folks. And I, my belief is that it's happening because we're not getting um, the participation that's needed to, you know, to, to, to encourage folks to keep doing this stuff. That said, I'm back here again tonight. Um, I think I have all of one person watching. That's fine, though. Uh, we're talking African religious survivals as factors in American slave revolts, a paper by William C. Suttles, Jr. Let's get into it. The historical experience of African peoples with religion has been incantatory. Religious ideas have been the instrument of ritual and ritual the rhythm of being. Religious ideas have lived. They have been purposeful rather than mechanical and eminent rather than transcendent. On the old continent, as well as in the new world of enslavement, religion has been invoked, called upon by the faithful and embodied by them. Among the slaves in the new world, Haitian voodoo is only the most frequently mentioned of the African or African-derived religious modes, there were many others, Afro-Brazilian, Ketu, Sex, Afro-Cuban, Santeria, the Winti cults of Guinea, Obia, and Mayalism in Jamaica, and the British Leeward Islands, and the conjuring of the invisible churches of the North American slave communities. These modes are not only important as data in the continuing argument over the, uh, over the extent of Africanisms in the New World. Vadoon and Conjuring are just as important for the way in which they are responses to the American slave experience as they are as proofs of the continuity of African cultural tradition. They are fundamentally African in their epistemological sources and in their quote-unquote aesthetic accompaniment but they have an American context as well in some of their vocabulary and imagery, and above all, in the way they are ideologically responses to a violent new world, quote unquote, colonial situation, whose meaning we are now only beginning to grasp. This American context is reflected in the differences in tone between the old and new world African modes, the religious practices of the centralized states of the Western Sudan, most American slaves came from this region, um, emphasized divine or royal authority. Religious life was concerned mainly with directing the cosmic forces towards a collective public good. It was different with the new world practices. Here, religious authority was in many instances aggressive and imperialistic. As Maya Darren has written, such practices as Wudun and conjuring meet new world needs that the settle and passive African modes could not match. Let me read that again. Maya Darren has written such practices as Wudun and Conjuring met new world needs that the settled and passive African modes could not match. I hope you all understand what that, what that what, what that's saying here. It's very important we understand these things. What was good in the old world faced some challenges in this new world. That passivity that we that we were able to have in our own nation, our own continent, ain't gonna work in this new world. And these new quote unquote new people in this new world that we have to deal with. That's a very interesting point. The appearance of such modes in America marks the revenge of the slave's intellect upon a hostile world. 
and owing to plantation authorities and form policy of suppressing the slaves' Africanized religious rights, voodoo and conjuring and similar modes were carried on secretly, clandestinely. As a number of studies make clear, these modes were occult, that is, radical, in the context of the Orthodox Christian imperatives of plantation authority. And this is a clue to the sometimes violent political implications of the slaves' religious life. Interesting. The connections between some kind of secretive or occult religious exercises and violent and, and, and violent rebellions seem fundamental to understanding the progressive history of exploited groups in the Americas. The connection was evidenced in some of the fateful struggles. The connection was evidenced in some of the fateful struggles between the Spanish and Amerindians in the 16th century. Just want to check something here real quick. Interesting. Okay. Okay, maybe. Okay. Um, the connections between some kind of secretive or occult religious exercise and violent rebellion seem fundamental to understanding the progressive history of exploited groups in the Americas. The connection was evidenced in some of the fateful struggles between the Spanish and Amerindians in the 16th century, and it was still operative in the ghost dance religion that, in, that, that initiated the North American Sui outbreak in 1890. The revolts and conspiracies of the African slaves provide only the fullest history of this connection. In the case of Jamaica, which experienced the most continuous and intensive slave revolts of any plantation society in the New World. Uh, what's going on here? Uh, my computer just did something strange. Hopefully I didn't lose. Hopefully I didn't lose um, the stream. Uh, the revolts and conspiracies of the African slaves provide only the fullest history of this connection. In the case of Jamaica, which experienced the most continuous and intense slave revolts of any plantation society in the New World, Patterson has written, quote, OBF functioned largely in the numerous rebellions of the slaves. In the plotting of these rebellions, the OBF man was essential in administering oaths of secrecy and in cases distributing fetishes, which were supposed to immunize the insurgents from the arms of the whites, end of quote. Voodoo, C.L.R. James has written in respect to the great Haitian slave revolution, was the medium of the conspiracy, and similar religious modes were involved in disturbances in the Virgin Islands and in the 1790s in the Baptist War in Jamaica and in the Afro-Cuban rebellions over the period from 1820 to 1847. Again, in North America, it was the sorcerer, the native-born Angolan, Gulla Jack, at the occasion of the Denmark Vesey conspiracy in South Carolina, an occult religious exercise anointed the bloody Nat Turner raids in Virginia in 1831. Similarly, the conjuring, a quote-unquote root man, was blamed for fomenting mid-19th century conspiracies and revolts in North Carolina, Mississippi, and Louisiana. No single formula is likely to explain all the possible connections between the slave's radical religious bent and his radical political one. Yet at least one significant generalization can be made concerning religion and purposeful violence among the slaves. In combination, they represented the slave's most creative response to the contradictions and tensions within New World slave societies. For whatever slave regimes were being assailed from outside forces, they were also being attacked literally at their centers by the slaves themselves. Plantation authority was confronted with repeated challenges, not only as a consequence of white men's uneven economic development, political crisis, and moral critiques, but also in the rebellion of slaves in their own ideological, for example, religious terms. In the period 1829 to 1832, for example, when the English and other slaving powers were immersed in and traumatized by economic and political debates over slavery, there were slave revolts in Virginia, 
Louisiana, North Carolina, Caracas, St. Jago, also known as Santiago, Tortola, Martinique, Antigua, and in Brazil. In his Slavery in Cuba, 1907, Ames spotlighted this very correspondence between the slaves' attack upon the system and more external threats. Here's a, here's a blurb. In Cuba, there has always been a very striking coincidence of servile revolts and unrest and the periods of economical and political crisis. The years 1843 and 1844, a time of liberal triumph in Spain and industrial crisis in Cuba, develop a servile conspiracy of extraordinary extent. It is therefore noteworthy that slaves chose moments for their revolts, which depended on crisis in faraway Spain or economical effects still more subtle. You see, these our, our ancestors were no fools. They took advantage of, of what was going on, right? Our ancestors were no fools. Okay, so I see. All right, so this is okay. I was just checking out something on um, social media while we're doing this show. Saw something kind of interesting there. Uh, if you guys are listening in the playback, um, you know, thank you for tuning in. You know, thank you for tuning in. And um, what we'll what we'll do is, if there's any comments or questions, you guys can ask those down in the uh, comment section, and we'll uh, we'll continue the conversation there. All right. Um, let me just post this real quick. Just gotta post this real quick. I forgot to post it earlier. Yeah. So our our ancestors, man, they understood. Like, for example, we have, you know, the U.S. is involved in this Ukrainian-Russian beef. That's not our beef. We are supposed to be making moves for ourselves. You understand? That's not our beef. I see we got Janelle here saying good evening. Good evening, Janelle. Thanks for coming through. Right, but these things aren't our beefs. We supposed to be using this and figuring out how to further our own cause. You feel me? I want to thank um, everyone who's tuned in today. Let's continue the paper. Often, then, the historical opportunity for rebellion, which the San Domingo slaves exploited to the utmost, lay in the larger system's own contradictions. Are you paying attention to that? You have to exploit the problems that these people have. The people who are over you, you have to exploit their weaknesses, exploit their contradictions in this case. The ideological cause of rebellion was often rooted in the slave's radical religion. It was the radical religious perspective of the slave that provided the stylization, the sort of insistency that led to revolutionary protests in New World slave societies. You know what I'm saying? I want to remind you guys, last week I read a paper, and at the end of the paper I read this um, tweet thread, right? This thread of tweets from Twitter. And they were talking about slavery in Barbados. Um, and they were talking about how in the 17th century there were way more slave revolts than in the 18th century. And some European observers noted that, well, it's perhaps because... Um, it was perhaps because, it was probably because the Africans in the 18th century were all Bayesian born Africans, right? Africans born in Barbados. Whereas in the 17th century, most of those Africans were coming right from the continent. And as of we as we've read in several of these type of papers, that African spirit was strong. Those ancestors of ours were fighting on the ships. They were fighting in the dock, much less on the ship, on the high sea. So there's something in there to be mindful of. But what that tweet thread did not talk about um, is the fact that not only were those 18th century Africans uh, 
born in Barbados, right? That thread does mention that, yeah, by that time, they they thought themselves as European. They they were happy, Barbados being former British, as you guys know, um, when the British defeated the French in, in some of the Leeward Islands, I think it was, they were happy for the British to win, right? But what's not being talked about also is by that time, these folks are not practicing the African religion. They've been made docile by their Christianity. And you, you might say I'm picking on Christianity. No, I have, this, I have just as much contempt for the Islam stuff, right? Or any of these European religions that, that's been pushed on black folks. But the revolutionary protests in the new in the New World slave societies was largely pushed, powered by, you know, um, was largely powered by their religion. So, that, so, so just to, just to tie off that thought, I don't have a problem with black folks being religious. You want to believe in God, you want to believe in certain rites and rituals and rites of passage and this, that, and the other, sure. But are you following the right one, the right God, the right religion? Are you following a religion that's going to make you docile and worship white folks? And don't lie, most of you Christian folks, I grew up in, I grew up in an Anglican church, most of y'all worship white people, let's keep it real. Most of you worship white folks. There's an old joke that um, I heard Damon Wayne said. I actually heard my grandfather say it one time too. There's an old joke that um, when black folks talk to white folks, they tend to bow their head a lot. Yes, sir. Yes, I got you. And they bow their head. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Get off of that shit. A lot of that kind of stuff, a lot of those those affects are because you believe that Jesus was a white dude who died for your sins. Even you guys in the NOI, you all believe in a white guy who came and gave um, this, this, this dude who, uh, who was um, getting all these young girls pregnant, um, Muhammad, right? Fahd Muhammad is a white guy. Don't y'all see every time y'all worship some Y'all are adhere to some religion. There's always some white person involved. Get back to your African concepts. That's all I'm saying. Get back to your African concepts. All right? Um, with that said, let's continue the paper. Character of slavery in the Americas qualifies slaves to a radical religious view of themselves. From the slave shore perspective, if not that of some historians, work in the new world was a matter of violent control, lacking any economic rationalization of its own of his own labor. The plantation slave had to be made to work through a violent intimidation, ceaselessly turning upon itself for murders and martyrs, mutilated soils, implements, animals, men and women. It was in this day-to-day -day situation that obsessed men channeled their deepest needs into some kind of unorthodox religion. Slaves revived or tried to revive the old African observances. Kudos to them. Kudos to them. I see we got gas them up in the chat saying, peace fam, peace to you, gas them up. You guys make sure to tune in to shoot the breeze on Saturday, on Saturday nights, gas them up recently joined us the last two weeks and has been a great addition. I hope the brother continues with us as well. You know, uh, and while I say that too, I hope more sisters start to come along. Some of you brothers, uh, some of you folks who join the show, reach out to the sisters that you know, that are conscious and that are conscious and uh, radical and etc. and bring them on, invite them to be on the panel as well. But peace to to gas them up. Good evening to Joe Nell. Thank you guys for showing me that you're here tonight. Please hit the like button while you're here. Please leave, uh, hit the like button. Even if you're listening to playback, hit the like button. 
right? The character of slavery in America's qualified slaves to a radical religious view of themselves. From the slave shore perspective, if not that of some historians, work in the new world was a matter of violent control. Lacking any economic rationalization of his own labor, the plantation slave had to be made to work through a violent intimidation, ceaselessly turning upon itself for murderers and martyrs, mutilated soil, implements, animals, men and women. It was in this day-to-day -day situation that obsessed men channeled their deepest needs into some kind of unorthodox religion. So I know I read that part before, but let me hit the new piece here. Slaves revived or tried to revive the old African observances. So y'all out here talking about your foundational and you descended from slaves and all this type of stuff. Well, why aren't you turning back and, 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 and reviving the old African observances? Because Isn't that what the slaves did? Well, really, this just proves really that you, you're just trying to be something other than black. You're Afrophobic. Under the amused or unknowing eye of plantation authority, they bound themselves in discipline to rights that call for their attention at every turn of work and rest. These modes were not always otherworldly or, com or compensatory. Boudoon and Conjuring did not simply rule over the slave's violin and waste it in trances. Thus, the slave servitor, tired of being insulted by his loas, that's from the, from the uh, Haitian belief, his loas or demon, as it's called in North America, started hearing the voice of God who paid him compliments and gave him advice. Typical in this regard is the advice of a Jamaican deity in 1820 telling the slaves, quote, they were free and they would not work anymore, end of quote. This too is a kind of defense mechanism, quote unquote defense mechanism, but it is only the beginning, a preface to active violent rebellion. For now, through the medium of his religion, the slaves, quote unquote, colonized self, his slave mentality, was disassociated and the slave willfully strove to destroy the material and human trappings of the plantation authority around him. You see, this is the difference again. Mm. Mm. You see, this is it right here. You see, the ancestors, in tapping back into, in reviving the old African observances, this is what's important. Those ancestors lost that slave mentality and willfully strove to destroy the shit here on earth and set themselves up for something better here on earth. But y'all like to listen to these, <laughs> these other folks tell you all about, you know, the, this shit up in the clouds. This, you know, I, I remember listening to a guy one time talk about the, we'll all be singing in seven different octaves. What the fuck are you talking about? How do you know? We'll be wearing white robes and, and gold slippers. Are you kidding me? But I have to suffer my ass here for this shit y'all talking about? Meanwhile, these other folks, they don't have to suffer that here on earth, but they still have a chance to get that on the other side. And this is what y'all believe in? This is what y'all raise your kids in? Like Dutty Bookman said, give up that white religion thing. Give up that white God thing. Like Scissor said, I have no white God. Because once you have that white God mentality, then everything these white folks do is godly to you. Historians agree on fixing the beginning of the Haitian slave rebellion, uh, sorry, Haitian slave revolution in the voodoo incantations held on August 14th, 1791 in the forest of Boyce Cayman. They also agree on the details, namely that it was a ceremony conducted by the black Hoon, Hoongian, I don't know that word, or pap, 
Papa Poli named Bookman, who had been born in Jamaica. As one master's coachman, Bookman was able to make contact with slaves in several plantations. And as the hound, hung man, uh, hung on, he was able to swear them into purposeful violence. Purposeful violence. Perpetually complaining of insufficient service, Bookman promised to withdraw the protection of the bon dieu from recalcitrance and to guide the souls of those who stood with him back to their African birthplace. All the servitors present dipped their hands in pig blood and swore to kill or be killed. Is your Islam, is your, what's this shit called? Yeah, Islam. Is your Islam teaching that to you? As a matter of fact, Islam actually teaches that to their people. Uh, Mr. Untouchable, my boy, Mr. Untouchable from the 242 is in the chat saying, working but listening in, Kuku. I appreciate that, Mr. Untouchable. I do appreciate you being here tonight and also being on the panel for Shoot the Breeze every week. I appreciate that. Perpetually complaining of insufficient service, Bookman promised to withdraw the protection of the bon dieu from recalcitrance and to guide the souls of those who stood with him back to their African birthplaces. All the servitors present dipped their hands in pig blood and swore to kill or be killed. And here's the thing about that. Here's the beauty in that little that last sentence I read there. It shows you, right, that you always had these, these sellouts who didn't want no parts of it, so-called recalcitrants here, right? But the people who listened to Bookman, if you peep what, what, if you're really being honest about what they're saying here, Bookman told them where their heaven is. Their heaven is back in their African birthplaces. So the people who followed Bookman were people who were happy to return to their African birthplaces. They were good on that whole uh, pie in the sky bullshit, cloud nine type stuff. They were good on that whole white robe and singing seven octaves and wearing golden slippers and all that stupid shit. So are you ready to be African again? Is the question. Not do you guys here put in specifically, but folks who will come across this video in the future who are trying to find their way in this whole thing. Are you ready to go back to being African again? Your ancestors didn't have a problem with it for the most part. And when when, 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 when most of them came together with that with this belief, that's when they were victorious. That's when they were victorious. To continue. The Haitian slave revolution was in many ways the climax of two developments, economic tensions within the slave society generally and the, and the development of the ideology of voodoo. Voodoo was not an ordered and purposeful body of thought among the Haitian blacks until the 1770s. Interesting. The period of its intellectual history from 1750 to 1790 corresponds almost exactly to the period of greatest tension within the society itself. Generally, the tensions within Haitian slave society involved intensifying external rivalries between a French bourgeoisie hardened to commercial capitalism and their political and economic dependence in the colony, the planters. Trying to keep pace with their creditors in the mother country, the Santo Domingo planters drew mercilessly on ever larger slave importations to open up new lands for plantation sugar and coffee. One consequence of this quickening pace of exploitation was that two thirds of the Haitian slave population in the 1780s was composed of native Africans who had not been quote unquote seasoned. And it was this group that gave thrust to developing 
perspective of Vudun and to an enormous increase in fear and severity. That makes sense. That makes sense. That that also goes back to, and, and I'm sure these Europeans learn something from that, right? You you make the the conditions harsher and harsher. Well, folks are going to try something more and more radical. The harsher it gets, the more radical it'll become, and that's when people will get together and start thinking. The thing I'm trying to get across to black folks today. Don't wait for it to get worse before you start thinking. Start thinking today. What the is it is that right? The the root word of scholarship, and I think in Greek is the same word I believe for for leisure. While while things I mean things are bad as as it is, so it's not leisure per se. But before it gets worse than this, take your time and start to think, black man, black woman. Start to think about not only today, but start to think about a hundred years from now. And eventually start to think about a thousand years from now, like these Asians do. I saw a picture today on Twitter. I think it was viral for a minute. It was this actress from, from Queen and Slim. Um, she's married to this white guy, Joshua Jackson. I forget her name. Sophie something Turner, I think. Um, I forgot her name. If you guys know the name of the chick from, from Queen and Slim, she's married to a beautifully melanated slim sister. Nice slim sister. She's married to this white guy from um, Dawson's Creek back in the day, if you used to watch that show, or if you're familiar, right? And she's on a balcony, naked, and his hand, I think, is on her ass or something, right? And if you see the numbers of black women in particular, just fawning over this photo of this naked black woman. Their, their backs are to us, right? She's on a balcony, ass out, titties out, ball naked like she was just born. And this white boy has his hand on her ass wearing a suit. And people think this shit is cute. Black folks, start to think today before the shit gets worse. We shouldn't want to see this thing get worse before it gets better. And something tells me we're going to do just that. We're going to wait for this to get worse before it gets better. Before we then start to think, like these brothers here in the paper. As things intensify, that's when they got more, that's when they got deeper. into their thinking about what do they believe in, what do they follow, and what they're going to need to get out of it. And there's an important line in this last sentence here. Africans who had not been seasoned The longer we wait to really make some moves, the more seasoned most of our people become. And the more seasoned they become, you could forget about it. We, 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 we're going to be pushed back another couple of hundred years every time that happens. One of the virtues of Maya Deren's magnificent study, Divine Horseman, from 1953, is that it illuminates this relation between theology and history. Voodoo, the slave society, and there's death. Voodoo in her shows was both the analysis and program for acting in the face of portentous developments within late 18th century Haitian society. The most specific reference for this was the Voodoo rite of Petro. Petro was born of rage. It's not evil. 
It is the rage against the evil fate which the African suffered, brutality of his placement and his enslavement. It is the violence that rose out of this rage and the protest against it. It is the crack of the slave whip sounding constantly, a never to be forgotten ghost in the petrol rights. It is the raging revolt of the slave against the Napoleonic forces, and it is the blind delirium of their triumph. Petro, uh, I, I, I wish Azuli was here to uh, talk about it in the chat a little bit, right? Uh, gas him up says, what's up to Mr. Untouchable in the chat, right? That's an interesting thing. Petro was born of rage. If you're enjoying the paper uh, tonight, I know there's only a few of you here, but if you are enjoying the paper tonight, drop a one in the chat for me. Let me know that it's a good choice of a paper at least. Drop a one in the chat. Uh, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a station ID break here so I could get a drink of water and whatnot. Uh, you guys stay tuned there. We'll be back on the other side, and I'll finish off the paper there. But let me know if you enjoy the paper or not. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is D Webb with the Harsh Reality Podcast. Ask you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the revolutionary matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Have you ever considered joining KWAZ Radio? Each of our hosts shares their unique perspective with you. You might have a perspective that needs to be shared. If that's true, hit us up at kwaz.radio at gmail.com. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What you going to do? Um, I want to continue reading the paper. I want to thank you guys for tuning in tonight. Make sure you hit the like button. Let people know that you were here. Uh, I didn't get any responses to that question uh, about the paper, but I'll continue and finish the paper tonight. Uh, it is not without a conscious malice that so many black revolutionaries and plotters have been labeled fanatics. In the case of Nat Turner, not only modern academic clinicians, but such authoritative white contemporaries as Thomas Gray and such genteel black ones as the contributors to the Afro-American magazine, 1859, spread the malicious word. But the fears and ignorances of establishments have their insights and this angle is worth pursuing. The social vision of rebels like Nat Turner is best begun with something so alien to our own time as the idea of discipline, religious discipline. For it is obvious, even in Gray's distant phrasing of Nat's confession, that Nat sought to transform his repression into active self-control through his own brand of religious discipline. He would turn fear and hatred into a disposition to purposeful violence. Nat, Gray tells us, was never known to swear an oath or drink a drop of spirits. He was a complete fanatic, systematically uh, ascetic. He swore off money and tobacco as well. He avoided crowds and plantation quote-unquote amusements. He said in Gray's words that he studiously avoided mixing in society and wrapped myself in mystery devoted my time to fasting and prayer. 
Nat's difference from those around him was not a matter of abstract sentiment. It was a matter of personal anxiety and commitment. As in the case of the Haitian rebels, the anxiousness was historical and the commitment religious. Born to an African mother and a preacher father, Nat's recollections were the genealogy of his own divinity. Right? So Ados would have problems with Nat Turner. Like they have problems with Malcolm X, by the way. At this time, I reverted back to my childhood and the things that had been shown me. I would never be of any use to anyone as a slave. Now, finding I had arrived to man's estate and, a, and was a slave and these revelations being made known to me, I began to direct my attention to the great object to fulfill the purpose for which by this time I felt assured I was intended. The same paragraph continues, while laboring in the field, I discovered drops of blood on the corn as though it were dew from heaven. And the spirit instantly appeared to me and said the serpent was loosened and that I should take it on and fight against the serpent. For the time was fast approaching when the first should be the last and the, and the last should be the first. And on the appearance of the sign, I should arise and prepare myself and slay my enemies with their own weapons. So I just want to say something too, because I know the skullduggery that folks like to engage in. Not Turner is not the rule. Not Turner is not the rule. Right? Not Turner is something else. You don't see many. And, 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 and there's a few others who are not the rule, too, when it comes to this Christianity thing. There's a few others who, who just a few, I mean, probably not even a full handful, who saw something different in that religion. But even those people, and this is the problem, at the end of the day, even those people are susceptible to the docility that those religions push. In other words, those folks will go but so far. They'll only go but so far with that religious thing. When shit gets real and you start taking out these folks like they did in those slave revolts, a lot of black folks lose their stomach for that shit. But what Bookman pushed to the Haitian people, they didn't lose their stomach like that. Gathered together in the Southampton woods at night in 1831, Nat and others took part in a pig feast and worked out the details of their conspiracy. Nat then arose and said, friends and brothers, we are to commence a great work tonight. Our race is to be delivered from slavery. And God has, an, and God has appointed us as the men to do his bidding. I am told to slay all the whites we encounter without regard to age or sex. Remember, we do not go forth for the sake of blood and carnage, but it is necessary that in the commencement of this revolution, all the whites we meet should die. And again, uh, again, this is the exception, not the rule. We got Athrazer uh, in the chat. That's the you guys should be checking out Athrazar's channel, by the way. This brother's constantly putting up his songs, his performances on the street. He says, I'm in the house and I've been drinking, so watch out. Okay, well, I I, I know Athrazar is, is a, a little bit of an adherent to this Christianity thing or what have you. Um, but you know, I call it as I see it. KW Don Seven is here saying peace to the chat, listening from the from the gig. So some of you guys are at work, some of you guys are like me. You work late in the evenings. Uh, I, are you guys overnight workers or just working late in the evenings? I tend to work well. I'm always working, but I tend to work late in the evenings as well, just to get some stuff done. Uh, I'm 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 live streaming from the gig, so to speak. To continue, 
It was on August 21st that Nat and a band of 60 slaves began their quote-unquote revolution. Before their work was stopped, at least 65 whites had been killed, while, as Nat later said, quote, a general destruction of property always succeeded the murders. It was in the history of North American slavery a revolt of considerable proportion. Athrazer says, I wouldn't expect any less, my brother. Absolutely. Right? 65 whites had been killed. The Tidewater, Virginia of Turner's Rebellion was a very ill-at-ease slave society. Apthaker has written that the bloody Turner raids came about at the end of a decade of depression and some five or six years of intensive agitation of the slaves in this atmosphere. So in this, in this hemisphere, um, there was economic maladjustment as a consequence of the depreciating price of cotton on the international market. There were great stresses on Virginia's uh, domestic slave trade. These stresses resulted in population changes in favor of increasing numbers of slaves concentrated in the Tidewater region and the plantation authorities' economic woes and fear of slave rebellion increased accordingly. On this latter concern, the Virginia governor stated to a nervous legislator uh, convened in 1829 or 1830, quote, a spirit of dissatisfaction and insubordination was manifested by the slaves of the country from this place, Richmond, to the seaboard. And one informed member of this legislator went so far as to warn the members that slaves were using their religion as, quote, veils for revolutionary schemes, end of quote. Athrazer in the chat says, Christianity saved me from a lot of bullshit and introduced me to a lot of truth. We'll always be grateful. It bound me to a lot of error. We'll always regret those parts. All right. Um, at the end of the day, I, me personally, I'm, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to get back to being as African as I can possibly be, you know. Um, and before there was a, before there was an alleged Christ, Africa had its its beliefs, you know. Um, make sure you guys hit the link to join the Discord if you haven't already. I see. I see the brother, um, Mr. Untouchable, is posting topics for Saturday. I know they're going to be good ones. Mr. Untouchable does a good job with with grabbing um, grabbing prompts and providing videos for those um, discussions. So I doing it. Um, don't worry about if it's dour or not. It's good. To continue, Nat Turner's brand of religion, as many white Virginians pointed out after the rebellion, was only the most political observance of an institution among the slaves called the quote-unquote invisible church. By the 1830s in North America, this mode was the most important cultural imperative of slave life. It was the meeting place for the quote-unquote hush harbors, the secretive nocturnal affairs of ritual and newmans and, that are so frequently referred to in the slave narrative. It was in the invisible church of Benjamin Turner's Tidewater Plantation that Nat Turner first gained the reputation. It was a statewide reputation among slaves by 1831 as a slave revolutionary. That's a that's a that's two interesting words to put together, man. Slave revolutionary. Okay. Possibly no two American plantation settings could have differed more than those of French, San Domingo, and Tidewater, Virginia. They differed greatly in the nature and extent of their economy, white societies and slave communities. And in the one, but not the other, there occurred one of the few successful revolts in history. But both these and other settings were violently exploitative work regimes for colonized Africans. And within them, some of the exploited were able to develop, just as present day blacks in prisons are able to develop their own ideas for their liberation. Voodoo and similar modes contained the ideological analysis and the rebellions, the progressive history of the slaves. And that's the paper tonight. Short and sweet. 
African religious survivals as factors in American slave revolt. So also what that says too is that Nat Turner didn't only move by his Christianity religion. That because remember they, they made a point to tell you that his mother was African, right? This brother was moved also by um this brother was moved also by you know his African lineage. The guys in the Caribbean, they were moved by their African lineage. We saw examples again going back to that tweet thread about Barbados. When the Bayesians, when the the Africans became, you know, um, Barbados born, they weren't revolting anymore. Not only were they not only were they Barbados born, but they were Christianized at that point. They weren't revolting anymore. But you see Africans straight off the continent, straight off the boat, st while on the boat. They revolted. There's something in that. So when when you look in the bio for the Bitter Medicine podcast and you see re-Africanization content, this is what I'm talking about. You cannot deny, right? You cannot deny that there's something here. When you look at the, the records, there's something here about Black folks being closer to their African selves and getting stuff done. It's just undeniable. Gas them up in the chat says, Nat Turner was about living the idea of give me liberty or give me death, which is a very African thing too. We've talked about that in several of these slave revolt papers. You know, these dudes once said, our ancestors, well, well, our ancestors who didn't survive, right? These dudes was walking off slave ships in, in, into the ocean, man. Straight up walking off of, uh, out of shackles, fighting, and just jump off the goddamn boat. This is what the whole Killmonger thing was about. If you go back and you listen to the episode I did with it was a book review with Carl Hezekiah. I reached out to Carl recently. I haven't heard back from him. But I reached out to Carl. We we used to do the, the Bitter Medicine Book Club. And we did this book. Um, oh, man. I have the book home, too. Um, it's a book about the fighting styles that came out of Angola and went to Brazil and stuff like that. And one of the, one of the things the book talks about, that's that Obi Tetch book. One of the things the book talks about is how the Africans had this belief connected to the water, that the co that the water will take them back to, you know, their home world, right? Will take them back to like a, you know, something like a heaven, but like a heaven in Africa, so to speak, you know? And so our ancestors was walking off into that ocean and like, yeah, cool. I'm going back. I'm going back. I'm going back to a place where I was a man, where I was a woman. Well, you know. Yeah, it's, it, 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 it's interesting. And we are getting further and further away from it. Yasim Up says, we, once we became Barbados born or Nigerian, we no longer revolt. Real Africans like Dr. Sebi and Fella understood this. Yeah. One of the things I love with, well, I love both of those gentlemen, RIP to them. Um, but one of the things I really liked about Dr. Sebi, and I talked about this on Shoot the Breeze not too long ago, the concept, and so many of us will overlook this and find all sorts of ways. This is why I, I laugh at some folks who are, who are supposedly radical. Because like Sebi put it, if you're really about changing stuff and being radical and I dare say revolutionary, how come none of these leaders have ever talked about getting back to an African diet? You feel me? 
How come they've never talked about that? So I, the, the re-Africanization thing is real. I appreciate it. And I appreciate anyone who's who, who's who's about that. Gassim Up says, funny, Captain Jack Sparrow said the same thing on Pirates of the Caribbean. He even turned the boat upside down. Notice they had the black woman named Calypso. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, Fighting for Honor is the name of the book. You guys can look it up. We... Me and Carl Hezekiah did a book review on that when we had the book club, and it talks about that. It talks about that. It talks about those connections to Angola and all uh, to Angola in terms of Brazil and the fighting style in Brazil. Right? Gasimov says many so-called African leaders are part of the lodge. Yeah, well, yeah, well, we know that. These guys ain't trying to be. <laughs> Uh, Afrizer says we have to be honest about something. African is not equal to right. There are many things that Africans did that were wrong. I I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Uh, and a lot of Afrizer are followed up with doesn't discount a need to return to Africa. I agree with that. The thing that you want to do, you always want to be authentic self but you always want to edit we know africans didn't do everything right way right again let's give an example so i, I guess he's speaking to officer but you know we know that you know uh, and again most people will shrug it off and say well Everyone was doing it, but that enslaving type stuff. Enslaving, like, like you know, we we had whole we had whole nations that were known for being slave raiders and going and grabbing folks. You know what I mean? Like, and in some cases, on themselves they were working with this woman. Let's be real about it. So we have to edit. And the thing that this paper touches on early that I think is important too, I think is important too, is we have to um, be honest about some things. Some things. from the old world in terms of Africa and African tradition, um, some of that was a little too passive in this new world. Now, we're all going back to our continent and we have nation powerful and we don't have to fuck with no one else. Maybe that's fine. We have understand by that. We have, we have always flew around us. You can go on but you should be with them and deal with them with us. So, but that's the shit. We're going to have to rest down and edit to edit equal to have the outlet more. They're going to edit some of the system. That's what makes the point. It's a school that's burning in us with I I definitely ain't gonna side with Drew, but yeah, that's what was doing to the, the so called civil. And then there's gonna be a fence. Most came up contact with these people, but you go on the east uh, again, all that is out. Um, but the, but the, we, shouldn't have got, we, we shouldn't have gotten into that. Um, so just import slaves, you know, operate them in house and hand on tables. New world, I agree with that. You know, um, the best part of being ourselves and letting ourselves to be even uh, a more better version of ourselves, right. 
Uh, is my breaking up? Okay, so maybe that's my mic breaking up. I don't know. I, I didn't do anything. That wasn't in all show. Uh, I saw the connection. Talking too much sauciness for you to. But I finished the paper. Continue to discuss in the comment set. So Gaston, Athrazer, you guys start off in the comment section of this video. Continue. I'll hop on. We will continue the conversation. Uh, I'm going to end here now. This is breaking up. And I'll see you guys on Thursday on the KBAZ radio side. You guys be good. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. If you like what you just heard, we hope you pass along our web address, bittermedicineblogs.com, to your friends and colleagues, and share our show to all your social media. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a KWAZ radio production. Join us next time for another session of the Bitter Medicine Podcast. Follow us on Facebook at Bitter Medicine Show, Twitter, Bitter Meds, Tumblr, Bitter Meds, Instagram, Bitter Medicine.